Hello and welcome to Mary Live. This is Dr. Mark Mervali. My friends in Jesus and Mary, the church during the week from January 18th to January 25th celebrates a week of prayer for Christian unity. And we have to see this from the heart of Jesus. It's a pain, it's a wound to his heart to have his disciples divided. So of course, all Catholics should seek Christian unity uh, with our Protestant brothers and sisters. At the same time, we have to define our terms and understand what does ecumenism mean from a Catholic perspective? Well, the best source is the brilliant encyclical, I could say that about every encyclical of St. John Paul II, uh, Ut Unum Sint, <clears throat> that we may all be one. And in Ut Unum Sint, his encyclical on ecumenism, he explains that we have to pray and we have to dialogue. So prayer is the heart of Christian unity and the Holy Father says dialogue is the body of Christian unity. But from a Catholic perspective, that efforts of Christian unity ultimately seeks an authentic ecclesial union which can only happen in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Now, Some might say, well, that's kind of cheating, right? You're saying, ultimately, Christian unity means we want everyone to be Catholic. Uh, yeah, that's exactly what we mean. But understand that this is not our doing. Jesus only establishes one church. And we, as members of the one church of Jesus Christ, those who are truly authentically Catholic, should seek others entering the church out of love. We want the best for them. We want the fullness of truth for them. There have been efforts recently, uh, and even back in the 1980s, uh, this was kind of a trend with the, the uh, unfortunate writings of, of Karl Rahner at that time uh, and leading into our own present era, of saying, well, no, we need to get a new structure. We need to get a new ecclesiastical structure. So we need to kind of get a, like a generic Christianity. And uh, in one of Rahner's last books, he said, well, look, the Pope can be kind of head, a titular head of the World Council of Churches. Uh, but he, he wouldn't be able to still be Pope, but he would be almost like, you know, the King of England. He'd be a source of unity and things like that. Well, this is absolutely um, materially heretical. This, this cannot be seen as an authentic means for Christian unity. We already have that. We already have the structure that will ultimately serve for unity. That's the one holy Catholic and apostolic church that Jesus Christ instituted. So Christian unity is not our task first. It's the task of the Holy Spirit to get everyone back into the one church that Jesus established. Now, granted, granted, there's got to be prayer, and there's got to be dialogue. John Paul makes that clear too. But he also says there can be no compromise of authentic Catholic truth or compromise of authentic doctrinal development as a way of trying to seek a type of what he calls a pseudo-ecumenism, uh, a, a, a false ecumenism. Uh, the, the Second Vatican Council talks about a false arenicism, uh, this, this effort of coming up with some new structure instead of the unity in the fullness of Catholic truth and faith which was given to us by Jesus. Remember the word Catholic and ecumenical are almost identical. You're talking about a, a universal uh, church whereby Christians, disciples of Jesus, receive the fullness of prayer and sacramental life and truth in dogma and the call to sanctity. So it's important, too, though we are praying for this unity and we're dialoguing for this unity, it's uh, superlatively important to know where we're going, what, what, what's the end of Christian unity. So, yes, Christian unity, uh, critically important. But what about Catholic unity? I'm afraid, my friends, that we are soon approaching uh, uh, another attack on the unity which we must have as members of the Catholic Church. Uh, talk about an extended scandal. Uh, we, we, we are the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Uh, we're one, but 
were at each other's ecclesiastical throats. Well, well, that's not a very good witness. That's not going to encourage our Protestant brothers and sisters to enter the fold. Now, St. Paul, in his first letter to the Corinthians, he talks about the divisions that were happening in Corinth at that time. So are you following Jesus? Are you following Paul? Are you following Apollos? We have to ask the same question today, my friends, as authentic members of the Catholic Church. Who are you following? Are you following this blogger? Or are you following that blogger? Uh, is the Vicar of Christ just one of many options? Well, look, let's make it very easy because sometimes, you know, we hear people saying, well, this is, a, it's complicated. Well, sometimes we make it complicated. So let's go back to the fundamentals of, of what protects Catholic unity. It is the Vicar of Christ. So imagine at the time of Jesus that there were one or two apostles that disagreed with something that Jesus said. Would you as a disciple follow those two apostles or would you follow Jesus? Well, that's simple enough, right? You follow Jesus. Uh, what, if his, what if it was eight apostles? What if you had the majority of apostles against something Jesus said? Well, the same logic is obvious. You're not going to follow apostles of Jesus uh, rather than what Jesus teaches. What if it's a commentator? What if it's a scribe? What if it's a disciple who uh, disagrees with what Jesus is saying? Well, even less should that be a threat to the unity that only comes from Jesus. My friends, this is the same dimension when we talk about Jesus' vicar. The vicar of Christ on earth, the Holy Father, the Roman Pontiff, is the guarantor, the protector of Catholic unity. When he teaches on faith and morals, that is something that Lumen Gentium 25 tells us we owe a religious assent of mind and will to the manifest mind of the Pope, even when he's not speaking ex cathedra, even when it's not something uh, dogmatic or infallible. So we're talking about the ordinary magisterial teaching of the Vicar of Christ. Now, we're not talking about personal opinions of if the Pope writes home to a friend in Argentina, or even positions on scientific elements. That doesn't fall within the parameters of faith and morals. What the Holy Father says about vaccines or what the Holy Father says about a particular climate change issue, let alone what he says about, you know, Venezuelan or, or Argentinian uh, World Cup soccer. Those are legitimately his, but they're not exercises of the ordinary papal magisterium. When he speaks on faith and morals, we obey. That's what protects our unity. This is not a popularity office. This is an office of the Vicar of Christ guided by the Spirit so that he does not err in areas of faith and morals. I say this because, once again, I am afraid we are soon to be experiencing yet more internal division. And if that internal division is fostered by rejecting the authority of the Vicar of Christ in faith and morals, then we cease to be Catholic. Uh, I, I, I find it interesting as I talk to Protestant uh, brothers and sisters that I know and say, well, when they bring up, well, uh, you know, all these battles about uh, the, the, the Pope, I, I thought that's what made you Catholic, is that you have to follow the Pope. And of course, specified once again, when he's talking about faith and morals, science or, or other elements of that, well, that's, that's a fair opinion, uh, but it's not binding on the faithful. So let's keep it simple. And I always think of the, the, the St. John, uh, John Bosco's uh, you know, Triangle of Catholicism, where he says, uh, and obviously we don't need to be theologians to do this. In fact, sometimes the theologians, dare I say, of my own company, are the ones who get us in a mess. So this is not about what blogger you prefer. This is about what pope you must obey in faith and morals. So Don Bosco said it's simple. Uh, there's the triangle you have to stay within. The Eucharist, our Blessed Mother, and the Holy Father. You stay within that triangle, you are Catholic. And once again, it is Our Lady, it's the Mother of Jesus, it's the spiritual mother of all peoples, that protects the Church. In fact, when popes have done things like papal dogmas, 
like the Immaculate Conception in 1854, the Assumption of Our Lady in 1950, it served as a great force of unity for the church. Because here's a principle you can bank on. If you are rejecting something about Our Lady, you are also rejecting something about the church. Whereas if you accept the fullness of truth about the spiritual mother of all peoples, you won't have any problem with what the church teaches uh, and the fullness of Catholic life within the church. And that's why, once again, I think we need to go to Our Lady, especially if indeed there's going to be still more division coming up within the church. Christian unity, yes, but Catholic unity is something we have to prioritize uh, because this is what carries on the faith of Jesus Christ, is this one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So, once again, I say, go to the mother. As we struggle, potentially even more, and, and once again, uh, as a side comment, uh, be careful of expose books. Uh, sometimes expose books speak more about exposing the character of the author than the contents. So let's keep focused on what it means to be Catholic in obedience to the Vicar of Christ. And Our Lady will help us do that. And quite frankly, a proclamation, you didn't really think I was going to end without bringing up the Fifth Marian Dogma, did you? A proclamation of Mary's the mother of all peoples would only strengthen the papacy and add unity to the church. So let's seek Christian unity in prayer and dialogue. Let's invite others to consider becoming Catholic. Let's make sure they have something unified to enter. Let's make sure that we are being instruments of Catholic unity, which is fundamentally expressed by our unity and obedience to the Holy Father and faith and morals. And let's pray to Our Lady uh, and consecrate the Church to Our Lady, in, in, b both in the sense of uh, our love of the Church, asking her to intercede for unity, but also Pray for the Fifth Marian Dogma. Uh, we saw this with the definition of the Immaculate Conception. The papacy was in exile, uh, and uh, there were foreign troops occupying the Vatican. And cardinals came up to Pius IX and said, Holy Father, proclaim the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. Let Our Lady help you in this situation. And Pius IX did. He proclaims the dogma. He returns to the Vatican. And it even leads to a Vatican I declaration of papal infallibility. Let the mother unite the church. And let's recognize her role as a spiritual mother of all peoples to bring us grace and peace that the world needs at large. So let's end by praying the prayer of the Lady of All Nations. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Father, send now your spirit over the earth. Let the Holy Spirit live in the hearts of all nations that they may be preserved from degeneration, disasters, and war. May the Lady of all nations, the Blessed Virgin Mary, be our advocate. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for being with us with Mary Live. God bless you all.